Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for taking some time out of your day today to, to join us on this webinar uh, from the News Literacy Project. Um, this is the first in a three-part series where we are going to be discussing how generally how to be how to prioritize credible information relating to the upcoming midterm elections. Um, this first session, we're going to be talking about credibility what makes uh, some sources credible and others perhaps not so credible. Um, and so we're going to be going through this um, over the course of the next hour. My name is John Silva. Um, I am from the professional community learning team here at the News Literacy Project. Um, my team uh, does exactly this. We teach news literacy concepts to adult audiences. Part of our work focuses on educators and how to teach this to young people. The other part of our work is doing things like this, talking to the general public about the importance of news literacy and how to be news literate. Um, I've been here at NLP for a little over five years, um, and I was a social studies teacher before that here in Chicago. If you would like to reach out to me directly, uh, if you wanna follow up with a question or ask something of my team, my email address is there on the lower left hand of your screen. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter at Mr. Silva. I do. It is a professional account. I do share a lot of things relating to news literacy there. Joining me for this is my colleague, Demario. I'm gonna let him introduce himself. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm a journalist and a former uh, marketing and communications professional. Um, I, I've started out at the Chicago Sun-Times and since, since then have either um, freelanced or worked at a number of digital uh, startups. Um, and I've worked at different type of newsrooms, different type of um, startup environments, and I really enjoy being able to use that approach and under, you know, understanding the uh, journalism industry and bringing more awareness to news literacy. Um, as a person that I grew up on the west side of Chicago, um, I actually still live there today. So I'm particularly passionate about marginalized communities and helping um, black and brown people get connected uh, and understanding uh, more about news literacy. Um, since this is a webinar, um, unfortunately, you will not be able to unmute and ask us questions directly. So we're using the chat function and the Q&A function. Um, if you're not familiar, if you just want to send a general message or make a comment for everyone to see, you can use the chat. If you would like to ask us a question about some of the concepts or the content, you can use the Q&A function. Um, I want to acknowledge the assistance of a couple of our colleagues. Alexa Voland and Ali Quick are also joining us from NLP. They're going to be helping um, in the chat and the Q&A. They'll be dropping links to some resources. So as I mentioned, we are from the News Literacy Project. If you're not familiar with us, we are a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization. We've been around for almost 15 years. For most of that time, we have focused on working with educators and in the classrooms. But in the last couple of years, especially during the pandemic um, and the more recent presidential election, you know, we have realized just the importance of um, news literacy education across um, adult audiences. And it is an important part of our work. Um, to do things like this, to bring news literacy education to people so that we can talk about what it means to be a reliably, credibly informed uh, person and how to be actively engaged in the civic life of our communities. As part of this, you can go to our website at newslet.org slash election 22, and you can see um, all of our other resources that we have that are related to the midterm elections and the things that we're going to be doing. And this series is just one part of that. So to kick off the, what we're going to be talking about tonight, one of the things we have to recognize is that we are being bombarded by information related to the election from many, many different sources. And they all have very different purposes. Um, so I'm going to start with an essential question to guide what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I think it's also an essential question that you can use when you're trying to figure out what's happening with the election Maybe, a, maybe you're trying to decide a candidate you want to vote for or how you're going to vote on a ballot initiative. When you see some information relating to the election, it's either going to be trying to inform you, it's going to be trying to persuade you, or it may be trying to manipulate you. And in that, in, in the, that latter piece, that manipulation, that, that could even be in the form of telling you things that are not factual and actually might get you to vote against your own best interests. 
So I'm going to start this first section about what it means for information to inform us and how we can figure out whether or not that information is credible. So it may seem overly simple, but I want to just start by defining what we mean by news. Um, news actually can be considered a lot of different things when we think about news programs and newspapers and things. But for the purposes of what we're talking about tonight, news is a specific type of information. And it is coming from standards-based news organizations and journalists who are trying to tell us about the things that are happening in our communities and the world in a way that is fair and accurate and impartial, right? So news is informing us. And it's that piece about impartiality and fairness and accuracy that is most important about whether or not something is really trying to inform us. One of the ways that we talk about this is, is, is what we call the seven standards of quality journalism. So when we talk about a standards-based news organization or really a credible news organization, we need to look for these standards in the work that they produce. So every news report that they publish or broadcast, we need to see evidence of these standards at work in the information that they're presenting to us. And one of the ways is simply by what is it, what does a news article look like? What does a piece of news actually look like when we see it? One of the first things that we need to look for is what's the vocabulary of the headline? A news headline is going to be very straightforward. It's going to stick to the facts and it's not going to have a lot of exaggeration or hyperbole or things. It's going to be, a, it's going to be to the point and it's going to tell us exactly what this article is about. Following that, the first sentence, also called the lead in journalism, is going to be a summary of the most important parts of the article. So when we see the headline and when we see the lead, we should have a good sense of what it is that we're going to be learning about through this news article. Credible news um, articles and credible pieces of journalism are always attributed through a byline. There should be the name of one or more journalists that we, can, that we can identify that we're responsible for producing this, this piece of news. And then when we're looking through it, everything that is published in there with, when it comes to quotes or the evidence that's being used or information from certain sources, it has to have been attributed to a source. There needs to be some attribution there. So if we see a quote, we need to know who said it. If there's a piece of data from a report, we need to know what that report was. And just in general, the, the tone and the, voca and the vocabulary of a news article is going to be um, in third person active voice. Um, so, this is, so this is one of the most important things we want to be looking for. In, in a way, it just needs to be straightforward. The who, the what, the where, and the when without a lot of extra flair or exaggeration language. One of the most important aspects of journalism is verification. When we talk about fairness and accuracy, journalists need to work to make sure that they're reporting information that they have verified. So this is a screenshot from a resource that we actually have on our website for educators. A former colleague of mine, Susanna Gonzalez, she was a reporter for Reuters covering the Jason Van, D uh, Van Dyke trial here in Chicago a few years ago. And th this is how she did her work when she would when she would get, be prepared to publish her story, she would go through and identify every little piece of information, no matter how small that needed to be verified. And once she had verified it, she had checked it off. And we don't often think about just how small these details can be, but everything from the spelling of a name, the date something happened, um, a person's official title, all of this information needs to be verified by the journalist before they publish it. And so, and that information can is also will can will frequently be checked by editors or other reporters of the news organization. So when we talk about news, it is about accuracy, probably above almost all other standards. And when we're talking about that information, we want to be able to see that these news reports have information from multiple sources. Um, we if we if we see a story that's from just one source, that's a bit of a red flag because all of these sources have different perspectives for what they might bring to a news report. Um, some of them can, are more credible than others, depending on the context. Some of them have, could have very specific information about a news event. Some may only have sort of general information about relating to the event. 
Um, but we we need to see this in the reporting. And this is kind of what this looks like. So this is this is a little excerpts from a story from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, a, a fairly fairly minor story about um, federal funding for expanding access to broadband internet in Pennsylvania. Um, and but there but there is this there is a state law that could that would could have an impact. And in the reporting from Charlotte Keith of the Post Gazette. You know, she used an official source in the executive director of the Central Central Bradford Progress Authority. Also, she had documentation where she looked at the actual guidance from the federal government about this federal funding. And she also brought in additional information from an expert source and a professor of telecommunication from Penn State. And so all of these sources, they brought slightly different information to the story, but this is what made it a more complete and fair and accurate story. But sometimes, like all of us, journalists make mistakes. When a news organization issues a correction, that is actually a sign of credibility. For some reason, some people kind of get hung up on corrections that when they make mistakes, that that's somehow a negative. Accountability is, is really important for the reputation of a news organization. And no matter how small the correction is, reputable news organizations, standards-based news organizations will issue those corrections. Sometimes they're fairly minor, like we had these that we have from the New York Times on September 27th of this year, right? Even the, the, the date that Arizona became a state, no matter how small, errors need to be corrected. So besides journalism, besides standards-based news organizations, they're gonna be one of the most important sources of information if we're trying to be informed about what's happening in elections watching the news, reading the news is going to be one of, is going to be for a lot of us, our primary source. But there's others that we should really take a, a moment to consider if we want to find out what is coming up in the midterm elections, what's going to be on my ballot. You know, we know about the big things like Senate races and House races, and in some states, you know, governors are, are up for re-election. But what about down ballot issues what about ballot initiatives and judges and local officials so we need if you to be informed on some of those our government sources can be very valuable here um, so the federal government at usa.gov has voting and elections information for across the country um, they can you can they can link to official voter guides they can tell you what races you know what local state congressional and local elections are up are, are happening, finding out uh, your state and local election website. If you don't know what your local election office is, you can find it there. Um, and then you can find out just more information just broadly about elections. But looking at your state um, and even your, your local board of elections, this is where you can find even more detailed information about what's happening um, on the ballot. Um, you can find additional information about ballot initiatives. You can find out about um, candidates for judges and things like that. And it's kind of the importance of the, really looking at those down ballot races um, and really going deeper than just the big, um, the big races that most of us are really kind of focused on. But then the other recommendation that we'd like to make is looking for nonpartisan organizations that are also trying to work for this. So the National Association of State Election Directors, um, they have a good deal of information on their website as well. Um, and they are, what they are trying to do is really emphasize the importance of state boards of election um, and how the, these agencies are working to make sure that our elections are fair um, and secure, which, which they have been. Um, and they're also kind of leading the fight to sort of push back against some of the misinformation surrounding election integrity. Um, so this is one organization, but really what you should be looking for are organizations that are that are working to be nonpartisan. They are trying to inform you of what is happening with the elections, what's on your ballot, whether or not you are registered to vote. If you're not registered to vote, how you can get registered. Um, and this, so this is Vote 411 from the League of Women Voters. Uh, we're actually going to be working with the League of Women Voters for sessions two and three of the series. Um, so this is a this is a good recommendation. So the emphasis with this is is looking for people who are trying to inform you, right? They're not trying to sway you. They're not trying to get you to to vote a certain way. They're trying to give you as much information as possible so you can make your own informed voting decisions. 
So I'm going to pause here um, after this first section to see um, what uh, questions. So Diana Rosen asks, what are best resources for readers uh, who for supporting judgeship candidates? What does it mean if a judge is running unopposed? So I'll take the last part. If, if a judge is running unopposed, just like any other election, they're, uh, as long as they get one vote, they're, they, they, they're elected to that position, right? It just means that no one else um, filed um, a valid uh, candidacy to, to run in that. As for uh, supporting judgeship candidates, um, usually, usually what you can do is to look for your local bar associations. Um, so here I'm in Chicago. So there is a Chicago Bar Association. There's an Illinois Bar Association. There's a number of others. Um, usually when I am trying to um, look at that, I, I kind of look at their ratings, but you have to kind of take those with a little bit of a grain of salt because often you will see people, judges who are on the ballot, but there's like nothing about them because they didn't, I mean, perhaps they didn't fill out the, the survey or they didn't sit for an interview or something. Um, so you can sort of see what some of those recommendations are, um, but it's, it's tricky because it, yeah, in a way, how can we really evaluate whether or not somebody is qualified to be a judge unless unless you happen to be a lawyer yourself it's it's a very tricky um area uh so jenny posted a link uh for missouri uh your missouri judges.org thank you jenny for posting that um so so yeah so i would look for your local bar associations it's going to be probably the best information you have available um, whether it is the most comprehensive kind of depends on how much work those bar associations um, are putting into it. Um, so we'll just pause here to see if there are some additional questions or comments um, to see if anybody has any questions. Um, we will take a look at what's going on there. So, so um but if we don't have any here um i'm actually going to hand off to um demario um i'm going to give him remote control so demario is going to take us through about determining the credibility of sources that mm -hmm. are trying to persuade us um so i'm going to hand off to Mario. take it away awesome thanks so much john um like oh. Like he was saying, um, this is a great time to transition from talking about the sources that are trying to inform us and looking now about credibility about uh, of the sources that are trying to persuade us. And it's important that we really understand that distinction. So when it comes to opinion journalism specifically, one second, my screen. It's being a little wonky. So when it comes to um, opinion journalism that's trying to persuade you uh, to adopt a, a specific point of view or a new ideal, um, it's, it's usually through, um, or it's ideally through fact-based evidence, like literal logical arguments that can be made through facts, something that you can check, something that can be verified. It's important distinction, like is, uh, opinion journalism is with this very concrete idea that we're using, we're presenting facts to help um, persuade you to an idea. Um, for me, I think this, and like when I first got into the uh, journalism industry as a college student, um, I was, excuse me guys, I am working with some bugs in this right now. But uh, when I was first started working as a college student um, at my uh, daily newspaper, uh, I was the sports editor. And when I found out that I was getting a, a column to talk about you know, whatever I wanted to talk about with the basketball team, I was so excited. I'm like, yes, this is an opportunity to talk about what I want. I can't wait to rag on certain things and talk about how bad the team is. And then my editors let me know, like, no, this needs to be something that is thought out, something that's planned, prepared, well-researched. Um, you know, your piece is, is a, opinion about something. It's going, it can potentially persuade people to think some, something about a player or about a coach. And those type of things, that's a really important responsibility to have. 
So that's from a sports side. But more on the political side, you see columns and opinions written every day in newspapers, right? You flip to the back of the New York Times, you'll see, uh, you'll see that it's an op-ed or some perspective piece about something. Um, and there's a lot of different sources throughout news media that are trying to uh, persuade you, but may also be credible at the same time. These are also credible sources, but another important element of them is that they're trying to persuade you. So you have everything from soft news and, and, and infotainment, which is um, Trevor Noah and The Daily Show, or, uh, last, or last, uh, last Week Tonight, um, shows like that that kind of bring the humor and the comedy element to you know, our news cycle. They, they focus their opinion through, uh, through uh, trending topics. Um, then you also have fundraising emails and flyers, right? These are coming from official sources, but they're also trying to persuade you to like donate or to give your time or to volunteer in some other way, shape or form just to be a part of that campaign and to communicate with them. Um, then you also have political websites like official party pages and candidate pages, which we'll get into more in a moment. So like I mentioned, uh, news organizations use opinion journalism to take a stance on, you know, a, a, a societal issue or to, uh, pro or to uh, prop a candidate or to get behind a candidate, excuse me, to get behind a candidate. And um, these things are their vehicle to be a part of that, like, uh, conversation, that political discourse, right? The difference between news and uh, hard news and opinion journalism is that this is their vehicle to talk about their opinions, uh, but doing it in a responsible way where they can be challenged um, and it's a logical argument. So to, to build upon that, um, Credible, these the credibility and good journalism is something that can be verified, right? You can prove it, you can find research, you can find references on it. It doesn't, but at the same time, opinion journalism isn't shying away from being biased. That's what, you know, having an opinion is. You're clearly taking a side on something. And, but at the same time, opinion journalism is inviting, it, an important part of that is inviting in counter arguments and for people to have different perspectives and different views it's you know i think of it as like starting a conversation right that's one of the you can't you can't tell if you want to start a conversation the more that you tell people that they can't be a part of the conversation the less it's an actual conversation so i think about that as like having the etiquette when it comes to you know being a, a community member even but um that's an important part of um uh, important uh, of uh, opinion journalism um, the next part of uh, an important part of journalism um, is editorials, and you'll see this from editorial boards from all the big newspapers, Washington Post uh, does a lot of editorials, Boston Globe, all the major news networks or news organizations uh, do editorials for the most part. Um, they explain really complicated issues. Uh, they try to get the heart of things that are happening in our society, and they, they try to be timely and relevant. Right. Um, but during the political season, um, during the election season, excuse me, they also um, endorse candidates and they try to the ones that align with their, their views and, and values. But um, there's also really interesting conversations now about the use of news organizations endorsing candidates. Like, is that responsible? Is it not responsible for, is, is it not a good thing for them to be taking sides on candidates? And that's a, a really big conversation that's happening right now in the journalism industry. Um, as things become more digital and we try to think about being more honoring of different communities. Um, and also, like, uh, the, the main point with editorials, and like I said, with a big, a, a big part of it and a really important thing to understand is that they ask for and invite um, challenge. They, they hope to create a conversation, a, a, healthy, um, a, a healthy conversation um, 
uh, inviting new voices and perspectives on things. That's an important part of it and can't, um, and I can't underscore that enough. A lot of times people think about opinion journalism and just think that it's somebody who's talking to them and talking about something. But an important part of good journalism and really credible journalism is that um, they invite people to refute them. So when you see opinion pieces online or on TV, there are a number of things that you should be aware of um, to kind of identify what it is. Because a problem with the news industry is that they don't always do a great job of delineating what's hard news and what's opinion journalism. So for instance, with CNN Business, uh, their opinion pieces uh, can be called, you know, it's kind of labeled under perspective, but they literally clearly label it here opinion right sometimes you'll see some news organizations call it perspectives or voices or reflections and that's it's probably like i mean it is it's part of the game of them trying to you know make you think that is news and playing with the system a bit but it's something that news organizations should take more serious and um, be more ethical about um, so that people understand what they're getting and understanding what's informing them and what's trying to persuade them Another form of opinion journalism that we're all probably pretty familiar with um, is the talking heads, uh, commentators that we see on TV all the time, your Don Lemons, your Chris Matthews. Um, they reflect a lot on current events and issues that are happening today, but their views might be in opposition of the editorial board. And um, uh, another element of that, I think, is also the transparency that news organizations are trying to seek and adhere to. Right when you um, when you allow voices that are different from your editorial board to challenge you and to challenge your notions and your thinking and your way of uh, uh, standing for your issues, it creates more of a, a feeling of community and conversation and uh, keeps that argument based, uh, fact based argument part of the conversation really important uh, as a priority. And so this brings us to the tricky part of sources that are um, trying to persuade you. When you think about political sites, they can be very informative, right? They're here to be, in, in most cases, they're here to be um, official sources, go-to sources about things that you want to know about a political party or a certain candidate or a certain issue. But it's important to also remember that they're trying to persuade you as well, right? They're trying to persuade you into an action like becoming a voter or registering for a program or um, becoming part of their subscription list. There are very uh, clear things that they're trying to persuade you to, so you it's, it's really important to be mindful of them. So even with, uh, when it comes to official party pages, um, you think that they're here, you know, your first mind is they're here to inform me, they're here to give me the official things, they're here to tell me things, and they are. But they're also here to literally get you to vote from one side or the other. Um, when you look to the left, you see the uh, Democratic page, the, the DNC page, you see that they're talking about um, how Congress, uh, it, how the control of Congress is so important this November, um, and will you chip in, i.e. will you donate? So they're clearly trying to get you to go into your pockets to help them out and to be a part of the mission. And on the right-hand side, the RNC is doing pretty much the exact same thing, but in different language. Um, they're appealing to you as, um, as an American and keeping our country free. Um, and you see that they also want you to sign up uh, for their different communications channels too, so they can um, uh, circulate their uh, newsletters, their flyers, their mailers, and different things like that. And it's also a way to have more communication with you because they also are asking for your, <laughs> your, your uh, zip code and your uh, phone number as well. So they have some demographic info. So they're really, they're actually asking a lot from you in this if you, if you, look, about, if you look at it that way. And then we kind of see on a smaller scale, the same thing with uh, candidate pages. Um, to the left, we see the uh, mayor of uh, a town in Illinois called Aurora, um, Richard C. Irvin. 
he on his page, he's clearly um, sent, he's clearly has a donate button and a get involved button so that you can get involved with his campaign and learn more about what he's doing. If, if you look at the copy in the photo, it says election day is quickly approaching, sign up. Like I'm sure that if we went back in the way back machine to figure out um, how his page looked, he will definitely have different copy. At some point in time, he might've been talking about uh, COVID. He might've been talking about um, some, of the, uh, some of the issues that are happening in Illinois right now. Um, but on the, on the right-hand side, you see uh, Governor J.B. Prisker of Illinois, and his page is, in a sense, is, it's a lot similar, but the approach is different. So he's not asking you to just donate your money. He's also asking you to volunteer your time and to take action. And once you actually click on the Take Action page, you'll see a number of different requests. It's like there are social media prompts and Create a super, uh, create a supporter video, and uh, joining JB's team on Facebook. There's so many asks on this, and they're trying to persuade you literally to support the team, the movement, and to vote for them ultimately, right? So when we're looking at information, even if it's coming from credible sources, if it's meant to persuade, it is highly critical that we think about where it's coming from, what the claim, starting with, what is it saying? We got to think about what is this actually trying to communicate with me? It, what is it trying to persuade me to do? And, you know, maybe you are in line with that and you wanted to persuade it. You, you, you wouldn't mind that persuasion, but it's important to literally think about it from the, from the fact of what supporting evidence can I, does this have to give this uh, argument some credibility, right? So are they having logical arguments? Are they bringing in fa facts and research, right? Can, are, have they opened this up to challenge from other um, lanes and voices? Um, those are all important things that really help us understand the credibility of, of sources that are trying to inform us, but even if it's through uh, persuasion as well, it's very important that we understand and uh, see this distinction. And so I'll, uh, before I turn it over to John, I'll kind of open up and look uh, at questions now, if you guys have any questions at this point. Mario, right, there is one question. I think you kind of touched on it, but uh, Kelly Vickstrom White um, asks, <clears throat> would the newspaper endorsements of candidates be considered trying to persuade? I mean, it's opinion, right? So yeah, they're trying to persuade you to um, to to vote for them, right? But they're doing it from the position of this is a logical argument. This is based in facts. This is based on our our values, our missions, what we stand on, right? So this is them trying to be a part of that uh, of that societal conversation, of that political conversation. This is them taking a stance on something. And then, uh, so Julian Swenson asks the best place, best place to look for info on school board candidates. So like major news organizations that will have endorsements for sort of national campaigns and such, if you're looking for something uh, as local as school board, you should look to your local sources of news. Um, the, your local newspapers, your local news organizations, they're going to be the ones giving you some information about, uh, about those races. Um, you should be able to sort of see what's going on, but also, you know, your local news organizations are probably also going to hold, hopefully hold candidate forums from time to time. Um, Stacy Stevens asks, I read Yahoo News and noticed some articles come from third-party sources like Market Watch, New York Times, Reuters. With these third-party sources, I'm starting to wonder if I should trust what I'm seeing. How is it possible for Yahoo News to verify all these sources of news? And how would you go about digesting news from so many sources? So my first thing is Yahoo News basically is using algorithms to pull news from lots of different places. It's, it's, it's acting as a news aggregator. Um, so Yahoo News is very similar to uh, Google News, also Smart News um, and Apple News, for example. Right? They're, they're news aggregators in the sense that they're, they're bringing that uh, information. They're, they're showing you news from lots and lots of different sources. And so when you look at that, you, sh you should still be looking for those standards of quality journalism. Um, but I think going through those news aggregators like Smart News, like Apple News, I think it's actually a really good habit to get to, to build because you're not just limiting yourself to one source. 
Um, so for example, Sydney uh, mentions confirmation bias when reading the news. Confirmation bias can be a very powerful thing. If you're only getting information from one particular source, you're really limiting yourself, not so much with the news piece, but really from the perspective. You know, with, with Demario mentioned, you know, opinion journalism. A lot of news organizations tend to favor one side over the other when, when they're presenting viewpoints. Reputable ones should be more balanced. Um, and so being aware of your own confirmation biases is, is something you should be careful. Uh, you should be careful of. Um, one additional question. Um, I'll, I'll hand this over to you, uh, to Mario. Um, George Kellum asks, how can you check on facts that are presented in a news article? Wow, that's great. Um, great question. I would say to look, reference it back. So like when you see something said, if it's said by something, see how clear it is, right? Do they mention the, the full name and title of the person, the place where they work? Um, you can always, like what I like to do is uh, like the, high, the, the exercise John showed, I'll highlight certain key points in the article and go look them up. So even people's names, literally highlight, and I do this for grammatical purposes really, but I'll also highlight people's names, make sure it's the exact spelling, make sure it's not like some crazy, not a doppelganger, but somebody else with the exact same name or similar name or similar spelling. Um, and then go through the other facts, their age, um, you know, what was said, if something was said, go through different claims, look at the um, uh, news articles, especially online now, they do a really good job of having um, of having the uh, materials, the source materials available. So like if there's a court filing, a lot of times they'll have the DocuSign version available. So like things like that, checking the hyperlinks and the different resources that they have uh, cited back to. So this is kind of a related question in the chat from Pamela. Um, she says, I feel like many political ads play off of quotes by candidates without the full context for them. What suggestions do you have for locating the full context to ensure the quotes are not being misrepresented? Here's a really cool thing about Google and search engine. If you take that full quote and you include the quotation marks, um, the search engine is going to look for that exact phrase. And so chances are, if you search for that quote, or even maybe just a portion of it, and you put it in quotation marks, you'll be able to find, maybe, maybe you'll find the transcript of the speech, Maybe you'll find another news report that's talking about the, the remarks that were made by the candidate, but you can actually find a lot more context with just a very simple Google search that way. And then Lee asks about news algor algorithms and um, uh, news aggregators and algorithms. And Alexa just, by the way, Alexa just posted a link to what we call uh, tips to Google like a pro mentions that uh, using quotation marks. But getting back to news aggregators, they do use algorithms to pull articles from these sources and organize them. But one of the things that you should look for with all of these, and, and so I know Smart News does this, Apple News does this, Google News does this, there should be something on their website or in, in their app that tells you what their criteria is for the inclusion of a source of information, right? Mo these news aggregators, they, ha they have some standards themselves. Um, for whether or not they think a source is credible enough to be able to include. So that's just, it's an extra step that you should do in, in determining um, credibility. Um, we have two more that I'm gonna go, we'll, we'll try to get to, and then we're gonna jump to the next section. Um, so Kay McKenzie asks, when you have a letter to the editor or a guest opinion with a byline that is cryptic, i.e. not a name, is it best to disregard? Um, I don't know that you, you should disregard it specifically because of a cryptic name on it, but letters to the editor and guest opinions, you know, they're, they are from people outside of the news organization, right? And news organizations, they will do some sort of vetting of these, but you have to remember that these are, these are just someone, they are simply someone's opinion, right? And they may, they may not be as supported with logic and evidence as, as something from you know credible opinion journalism might be. So I would say with letters to the editor and guest columns and things, um, just be a little a little extra cautious and give it a little bit of extra scrutiny before you actually do something with it. 
Um, and then Barbara Hall asks about evaluating bias and the accuracy of news and opinion from organizations like AdFontas with media bias charts. So we have we're going to be talking about media bias in in a later session to a certain extent. But there's a couple things about the media bias charts that are very popular. Um, AdFontas Media is one. Um, All sides has another. There's there's two major things you should just sort of be cautious of. Um, the first is that those really only focus on partisan bias, right? They really only focus, is it left wing? Is it right wing? Is it liberal? Is it conservative? And those determinations are made by focusing on the opinion content of those sources, right? And, and in doing so, it kind of oversimplifies and it gives the perception that everything that these organizations put out all follow that same political viewpoint right but when you look at when you look at major news organizations and you and you sort of watch what they put out there's there's more balance to it there's more opposing viewpoints so in some ways they they oversimplify a complex issue um and, and in a way they they also kind of reinforce our own perceptions right um and and so they they're very debatable um but the other major thing that we we sort of urge caution about is that, and this is especially true of the ad font test chart, there are so many organizations on that chart that are in no way trying to be unbiased, right? There are some organizations on the chart that all they do is put out opinion content of one form or another, right? They, they don't put out anything that's trying to be news in the sense that it's trying to inform us in a way that's fair and accurate. And so the idea that some of these organizations can be evaluated on the same chart as news organizations that focus on original reporting, like the Associated Press and, and Reuters, for example, it creates a, a false equivalence, right? The idea that Infowars, for example, can be evaluated using the same criteria as the Associated Press on its face is kind of ludicrous. So it's a good, they're a good starting point for discussing a certain type of news media bias. Um, but we have, a num we have a number of resources to kind of think about evaluating bias in a news way, a new way. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail um, a bit later. Um, so we'll, we will, so um, Alexa just put a, uh, a link to understanding bias in there. And we'll provide some links to those in just a second. So you can so you can take a look at what Barbara was mentioning. Okay, so let's go into the last section of what we're gonna be talking about this evening. And this is gonna kind of lead us into session two. Um, it's about when persuasion gives way to manipulation, right? So as Demario was talking about, persuasion is really about trying to get us to come around to a viewpoint in a way that's supported by facts and evidence and logic and reason. One of the things that is very common in this, especially when we're talking about elections and politics, is political propaganda. Um, when we stop using facts, when we stop using logic and reason, and we start to try to uh, manipulate us emotionally, especially to trying to push that there's only one view that is true and valid and all others are wrong, we've really crossed an important line into, into political propaganda. And because propaganda is all about provocation. It's a blunt force, hard, emotional thing. It's try, it takes distorted information, um, in, in many cases, false information. And it's trying to use sort of a maximum emotional impact to get us to, to sort of come around to a viewpoint without any kind of critical or rational reasoning. Um, the people over at the museum um, have some great resources about some common propaganda techniques um, that you can that you can that you can kind of take a look at for yourself. In the sense that these, when when we see some of these things, right? When when you take a very complicated issue, especially like something about you know, maybe if it's a major ballot initiative or some some policy initiative, and we try to make it seem very very simple. That's very. That's a very common propaganda technique because it's trying to make us think of it in, in only a, from a very particular perspective. Um, another one that's also very common that you have to be careful of is division, right? When 
they're trying to make it seem as if it's an us versus them, that there's an in-group and an out-group, especially if you sort of see and feel language at, like that you're at war with something or you're battling against somebody else, right? That's trying to exploit deep divisions, and, and it's it's a very common propaganda technique that, that is out there. Um, we have to be aware of logical fallacies. They are very, very common um, when people are talking about political issues, right? So this is this is from uh, ZME Science uh, talking, breaking down a meme that was based on logical fallacies. But some some that are very common: ad hominem attacks, right? So instead of talking about an issue, you're attacking somebody else. Um, false equivalence is also a very common one. Um, and, and so looking out for these logical fallacies is, is something you have to be careful of because they're trying to get you to they're trying to get you to think about things in a way that is actually not logical. Um, relating to this is when we see these big claims that actually just really aren't supported by any kind of evidence. Um, very, very common with memes um, in particular when we see these on social media. Um, so this is an example where somebody claimed that uh, the president of Ukraine um, had a, a monthly income of eleven million dollars, right? So this this was out there, but there's no there's no link to any kind of evidence to to tell us where this came from. There's no context for this, right? It's just it's just this image that says, "Hey, look, he makes eleven million dollars a month," um, and so. Um, PolitiFact, they did some research into this and they they did a fact check and they said, actually, uh, no, that's that's actually not true. But they they figured out where it came from. It actually came from a blog um, that for some reason was just pumping out these memes, making these false claims about politicians and celebrities. So when you see a claim, you you should look to see if there is a link to where that information came from, or at least some citation of a source, right? We need to be able to see where the information is coming from. And so this is a, a, a related example about what we call cherry picking, right? When you very carefully select a particular piece of information and then you use it to, to spread your belief, it, this is also a propaganda technique. So. Um, this account um, at Junk Science, um, he puts out a lot of things trying to spread the idea that climate, climate change is a hoax. Um, and so here he took uh, a graph of one month uh, from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, right? So he, so he picked this one very specific graph and posted it and says, this proves my point. But he didn't give us any link to where he got it from. He, he, we have no way of verifying it ourselves. We have no way of looking at the data that went behind this chart, right? So, you know, this is an unsupported claim using cherry picking um, and trying to, you know, trying to oversimplify, you know, a very complex issue of climate science. Um, we can sort of see somebody responded to it and actually says like, you know, here's the real data and actually provided a link to the to the website at noaa.gov where you could you can see all the data that went into the, the chart that um, Malloy posted, but also others um, and showed a more accurate data set that actually reflects, you know, the reality of climate change and shows, you know, just shows how his claim is, is really unsupported. Um, so when we talk about misinformation, um, they come from a lot of common sources. Um, political parties and political campaigns do sometimes spread misinformation. Um, whether or not it's intentional is it depends greatly on you know whatever is being spread and who's who's spreading it. Doesn't this is not to say that they all spread it, but sometimes they do spread things that turn out to not be true, and they will use cherry picked information or false information because they're trying to manipulate us into voting one particular way. And we would be basing that voting decision off of misinformation. Advocacy groups do this also. Um, there are some advocacy groups that are out there. They're trying to get us to vote a certain way, and they're trying to do it in a way that's not uh, that's not factual. So this is from an organization called No to Prop One in California. Um, it's, this is a, relating to abortion funding in the state of California. So this is on the ballot in California um, here in a few weeks. Um, but they've actually put out false information, um, not the whole thing.
Sorry about that. Um, not the whole thing, but it's mostly false because one aspect of it, they use some false information to drive the rest of it. So these advocacy groups are trying to influence us, particularly about policy issues and social issues. Um, so we have to think about what is the motivation behind this advocacy group? What are they? What is it that they're trying to 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 ma manipulate us into? Um, and they will all. They can also cherry pick information from polls. They may fund their own research, their own polls, and, and you just have to be very careful about that. And then you have you have others out there um, who are trying to be influencers in the political space. Right? These are people who just have built up a following. Um, they put out a lot of their 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 own opinions. Uh, sometimes we, you know, sometimes we may call them pundits, but people are creating content across all major platforms, um, and we just have to be careful because they're not—they're not trying to persuade us in a way that's necessarily credible. Many of them are, but sometimes we have to be cautious because they could—they frequently will spread misinformation because they're trying to increase their own influence. In many ways, the more shocking and the more outlandish they are, the more followers they can gain. And then we also have to be careful of those these some of these hyperpartisan outlets, um, right? So when I talked about the media bias charts, right? These these some of these outlets they're not trying to do, um, you know, news reporting in the sense they're not trying to inform us in a way that is fair and accurate. They're trying to influence us um, through their own political viewpoints, and sometimes the information that they post um, turns out to not be factual. Um, so the more partisan an outlet seems to be, the more cautious we should be. So one thing to watch out for is, you know, when I'm when I'm looking at one of these sources, do they present opposing viewpoints in any meaningful way, right? Or do do I only see information from one particular viewpoint? And when that happens, you know, they're they're pushing a very specific political agenda, and they will often be posting um, false information. So we have one great resource that we recently published and just a couple of things just in general to watch out for, especially when we're talking about misinformation and people trying to manipulate us. There, we, there, there are three very common times, types of election rumors. Um, this, this was a very common accusation during the 2020 election, the issue of ballot mules, this idea that people were going out and um, collecting up people's uh, either mail-in or um, uh, collecting people's ballots to deliver them to voting places. Um, every state, every county has different laws about whether or not people can pick up and deliver your uh, your ballot for you. Some places it's totally legal. Some places there's, there's restrictions. Um, the National Conference of State Legislatures actually has uh, a great website. We can link to it so you can see what your state's laws are relating to this. But the reality is, is that um, the Heritage Foundation in a study that they did there's only been 238 cases of election fraud since 1988. That's it. Um, so yes, there have been some, but in 34 years, that's a sh that is a shockingly low number. So watch out for when people are talking about ballot mules, because chances are they might be trying to push something that isn't true, and it, and it could be a sign of, of political propaganda. Relating to this is uh, rumors relating to mail-in ballots. Um, We've been, people have been voting by mail since the Civil War. My very first presidential election, and, and I'm going to age myself, my very first presidential election was 1992. And I was deployed overseas and I, and, and uh, with the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit, and we, we all mailed in our ballots. We, we, we got our ballots and they were collected and they were put in mailbags. And, you know, the, one of the supply helicopters took them off, but we were still able to vote, even though we were on the other side of the world. Um, and voting by mail is very secure, and it's it's been going on since the Civil War. You can go. Some states now have the ability to track your ballot. You can, if you mail in a mail in ballot, you can actually see where it is. Um, so you can learn more about voting by mail and how it's and how different states use uh, use methods to secure it. Um, and you can also see some information about how rare voting by mail ballot fraud actually is. And then the third one, this was also this was also very common during the 2020 election was rumors about um, uh, poll workers um, being involved in fraud. Um, and I've worked as a poll worker before. Um, I, I can tell you polling places are very complicated, busy, overwhelming places. 
I can't imagine that people would get would be able to organize this, but you can sort of see a lot of things about polling workers, how polling workers are recruited, how they're trained, how they how they you know, there's oversight of them, and you can learn more at the National Conference of State Legislatures website there as well. But also just in general with these, you have to be careful and be aware of your own confirmation biases and the motivated reasoning on the part of people who are trying to perpetuate these these rumors and falsehoods. And so, what's at stake? Um, there's a couple, there's a couple of very big problems that all of this can cause. Um, there is a likelihood that there are people who may not show up to vote because they have been bombarded with false information about the, the integrity and security of elections. Um, and in some cases, people who are, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get people to not vote. Um, and they're trying to undermine people's, um, trust and faith in this. Um, in some cases, people may be uh, manipulated into voting against their own best interest, or they may be voting in a way that they not they may not realize because because of false information. And all of this is about just trying to undermine our faith in what are very secure elections, and to delegitimize the election process to the point where we just we become more cynical and we feel like we just can't trust anything. Um, so before I close out for final questions, I want to mention a really cool resource that we have that just went live recently. It's called Rumor Guard. Um, this is where we uh, are talking about uh, viral misinformation and, and things. We're going to have a lot of things relating to elections coming up soon. Um, but not only do we is this fact checking, but we also walk you through like how you can verify things for yourself, big questions that you can ask about the authenticity of a piece of information. Is the source that shared it, um, is it credible? Can you confirm the credibility of that source? Um, can you evaluate the evidence for yourself? Like, did they actually provide evidence to support the claim, right? And can you look it up? Um, that's, that's a really important thing to look out for. Um, can you verify the accuracy of the context, right? Um, when you somebody had mentioned about quotes, like, do we know where that quote came from? What, what was said right before the quote? What was said right after the quote? Um, that's very important. And then the last one is, you know, just the logic check, the reasoning check. Does it make sense, right? Does the evidence support the claim in a way that is logical and, and reasonable, right? Because if they're not connected, you know, the whole argument falls apart. So you can join the Rumor Guard and you can participate in this and you can learn some of these tools at rumorguard.org slash join. And we will drop a link to that in the chat. So as we get ready to take questions, we have two more sessions coming up. We'll be working with the League of Women Voters on these two. We'll be doing a deeper dive into election misinformation on the 25th. We'll also be talking about what makes misinformation go viral. And then we'll be doing how to debunk misinformation and talk to people who believe it. Um, in the last session on November 1st. So um, while I look up questions, um, if you would please, if you have a, a few minutes, um, take, a, take a minute to give us some feedback. Your feedback is very important to the work that we do so that we can make sure we're providing relevant and actionable information. Um, so we will post, yeah, you can post these charts. If you took a screenshot, please share it on social media. Um, go right ahead. Um, um, do, so Mike asked, does Yahoo and other services get paid every time you click on an article? Yeah, there, there is a financial interest with advertising, right? And you do have to be wary of clickbait. But an important thing to remember with advertising is that in reputable news organizations, there's a very clear firewall between the newsroom and the business office, right? That there is there is the, the people who are getting that revenue, they're, they're taking care of the advertising, and it doesn't have any influence um on the on news coverage um so i'm going to take a quick look so we got some things that are being posted in the chat um hopefully you have an opportunity uh to take a look at rumor guard karen jackie says rumor guard is really cool thank you so much we will pass that on to the team that will work on that um, mike asked if we can print the chat log uh we'll get a transcript of the chat mike if you drop us an email um, we can probably send you a copy of the chat, um, the chat log, if you, if you would like it. Um, so if we could put a link to the chat, this is a survey in the chat. That would be awesome. Uh, Pamela would like that, um, as well as Kate. Um, so if we can take it, if we can put a, a link to that in the chat, that'd be great. 
Um, I'll look to see if there's some other questions. Um, if you don't have any additional questions, um, thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening. Um, we hope to see you next week when we do the deep dive into misinformation. Um, on behalf of my team, uh, the personal community learning team, as well as those of us at NLP, um, thank you for joining us. We really hope you found this informative and we are very hopeful that you will be joining us uh, in the fight for facts and to promote reputable, credible sources of news and information. Um, we will send links to the, uh, to the slides when we send out the video. We'll make sure we send that to, ev to everyone who registered. So if you, everyone who registered, will get a link to the recording. We will also send a link to where you can get a PDF of the slides and we will include relevant links in that follow-up email as well. Um, Karen Peterson asked, what do I think of IllinoisPolicy.org? I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that website. Um, but I can probably take some time to look it up and I will see if I can email you a response. Um, let's see, Annette, thank, thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're really appreciative for your support. Um, thanks for doing this. Um, Kate, you were very happy to do this. Uh, okay, the QR code may not be working. Um, we're sorry about that. We will send out a link to the survey um, afterwards via email so people can take a look at the survey. So um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, we are very much looking forward to seeing everyone hopefully back next week. And please feel free to share the links with people so that we can get more, more folks to join us. Um, and please make sure you vote and make sure you cast an informed vote from reputable, credible sources of information. Um, it's, it is all the more important with midterms. And so we want to make sure that we're all voting for our best interests and making it an informed vote and also becoming more involved in the civic life of our communities. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye.